Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode, teaching staff from Kildalton College, Zerlina Pratt and Aidan Nugent give insights into the performance and practices of the dairy unit on the college farm, including the role of teaching skills to students and the continuity of education during COVID. So the herd here has an average EBI of 175 euros. So it's in the top 3% of the country at the moment. Up to this year, we've been operating with about 110 cows on a 46 hectare milking block. So we're hoping to increase that to 120 cows in the next year or two. All the cows are now in the sheds, they're dried off and we use selective dry cow therapy with the cows here for the last two years. So 22 of our cows would have been dried off with just teeth seeder only this year. Um, our empty cows would have been sold then off at the back end of the year. So we have 28 in calf heifers then to come into the herd in 2021. In terms of cow type, 20 of the cows in the herd have Norwegian red in their genetics and we have 45 crossbred Jersey cows. So we've a good mix of crossbreeding bred into the herd over the past, I suppose, six or seven years. Um, the system is a, it's a very early spring calving grass-based system. And one of the main aims we'd have here with the dairy herd is to demonstrate best practice to students. So achieving high milk solids per cow off a sustainable grass-based system and um, doing that with, with high EBI cows. And, and you mentioned that grass-based system, Zerlina, and as you say, a demonstration farm for students coming into the college um, during the academic year. What metrics are you looking at, are you chasing in terms of grassland to achieve that high level of performance? Yeah, I suppose it's, it's something we, we drive home here with students. So we start calving here in the third week of January. So cows are out to grass by the last week of January um, and they're finished up grazing. They finished up grazing this year in the last week of November. So we'd always aim to have them out for at least 300 days in the year out grazing. Um, we produced just under 13 tonnes of grass this year ac- across the platform. Um, we completed about 60 grass walks this year and a number of those would have been completed with the second year advanced dairy students. So they complete grass walks as part of their course and they input the data on pasture base with us. So they kind of, they help us make decisions then on the feed situation for the cows in the coming week or two. So to date we fed 650 kilos of meal per cow and we'd always aim to try and bring that down further, you know, each year. So we reseeded about 15% of the dairy paddocks as well. And we just show students paddocks being reseeded and we show them how we select grass and clover varieties from the, the pasture profit index just to put into our seed mix. So there's a lot of exposure for students on the farm, I suppose, to to things that are happening and decisions that are being made throughout the year and and what our targets are, especially in terms of grass and and management decisions. You also mentioned, Zerlina, that you're going to, you're planning on increasing cow numbers over the next two years from 110 to 120. Is this resulting from increased productivity in grassland or is it increased land area that you're going to farm as part of the dairy unit? I suppose it's, it's increased uh, productivity from the grass that we have at the moment. We, we're receding at least 10% of the platform each year. And it's, I suppose I've only been in, in terms of the, the um, dairy platform at the moment. I've only been there in, in the team with, with Aidan and, and um, the rest of the gang for the last two years. So it's something we've worked on, I suppose, to, to try and increase the productivity of the grass. And we've worked hard with reseeding and picking out paddocks that are, are lacking a little bit and getting sward productivity up. So we have the sheds and we have cubicles enough for 120 cows. So it's our target to, to get up to that number. And productivity with the grass has gone up. Um, even upon last year, it's gone up by a ton. So we are getting somewhere with, with increased productivity on the, on the same land block that we've had, um, I suppose, with the dairy herd for the last number of years. And I think you're, you're similar to a lot of farmers and we would have spoken recently with John McNamara and, you know, very similar to yourselves. He's talking about increasing uh, cow numbers wh- when he has the, uh, the grass there. So very similar to what you're doing. I guess, Aidan, then if we turn our attention to you um, and, and talk about cow performance. So Zerlina mentioned that over half of the cows have an element of crossbreeding in them, be it Norwegian Red or Jersey Genetics. Can you give us some insight into the cow's performance performance on an annual basis yeah i will of course emma no problem uh so just there on friday last the 4th of december we dried off the last of our remaining cows so on average cows did 295 days in milk 
Um, and this year we produced 532 kilos uh, per cow uh, of solids. So that's coming off of an average fast throughout the year of 4.61% and protein at 3.68%. Uh, uh, and as mentioned earlier, that's just um, just under 650 kilos of meal per cow. So we're quite happy, um, I suppose, to date with that, with a, a, quite a young herd, and we'd hope to build on it again from next year on. And if we could try and reduce the concentrates of meal uh, and get more out of the grass, we'd be we'd be we'd be on target there. Uh, cell count across the year then, on average, was 111,000. So um, a bit to work on, but we're happy enough. Yeah, really solid uh, performance there, Aidan. And you mentioned, you know, it's a it's a, a young herd. What would the profile of the herd be? Would you have an idea of the percentage of heifers or second lactations in the herd? Yep. So uh, percentage of heifers there, there would have been uh, 22% of heifers going into the herd there in 2020. And it would have been a similar number again last year. So there is quite a young number of animals in the herd this year. Um, we'll have 24 heifers calving down. Uh, sorry, my apologies. We'll have 28 heifers calving down in 2021. So it is a quite uh, young herd. Um, just if we could keep folks on keeping keeping animals in the herd and uh, uh, keeping them in, into late lactation, we, we, we will be happier um, across the farm. And and you mentioned 295 days in milk. And, and of course, that is the target. But we do often see that, you know, there's a considerable number of maybe March and into April and sometimes May calvers on farm that can very much um, reduce that average days in milk to maybe 270. You know, um, do you see a range across um, the different lactations in the herd? Would you give the heifers um, an extended dry period relative to the cows or is it pretty much an average of 295 across every cow in the herd yeah so in general the heifers will be dried off an extra two or three weeks earlier they would like to see them get 10 to 12 weeks of dry uh of a dry cow period but um the older cows once once we see 305 days we'll be hoping to pull the pin um because generally our calving interval is quite good uh, just over 370 days so it we, we'll give our cows eight weeks dry anyway uh, that would be giving us our 60 days 305 days and and then to consider the fertility performance Aidan um, you know what are the main KPIs that you will look at from a fertility perspective and can you give us some insight into how you're performing with that yeah so in 2020 there this year gone our calving interval was 376 days um, so a small bit of work to do there in the in the next coming years um, we had 89% of our cows calved in six weeks this year, so we're happy enough with, with, uh, with them stats. We started breeding there in 2020 on the 22nd of April, and we bred for 11 weeks, um, while our six-week in calf rate was 81% for the cows and 100% for the heifers. The cows were scanned then in September, and we came up with an empty rate of 10%, which was probably uh, a bit more than expected. Um, and those animals have since been, um, I suppose, removed on the back end of the year. Uh, for 2021, then, we're expected to start calving on the 20th of January, and we're expecting 88% to be calved in six weeks. Uh, of the calves that we'll have on the farm, 70% of these will be uh, Frisian calves. That'll be a total of 87 calves. And then the remainder, 30% of the animals, will be from a dairy beef um, dairy beef bulls. So we'll have roughly maybe 23 Anguses, 12 limousines, and we'll have two Belgian blues, which we didn't have here before. So easy calving uh, dairy beef bulls um, will be used and hopefully it will calve down in 2021. Uh, the heifers then were bred to easy calve and high EBI Holstein Frisian bulls. Likewise with the cows, we select high EBI Holstein Frisian for replacements. And the remainder, as mentioned, are your limousine Angus and the blue for next year, all from the dairy beef index. I suppose just on uh, the calves, we, we rear replacements, uh, 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 replacement heifers on farm. Um, we, we keep what we need for, for, for replacements and we sell the remainder. And our bull calves are sold to a local farmer or else they're finished on farm as calf to beef here in Culloden College's beef unit. So very much a blueprint, Aidan, in terms of the you know high level of fertility performance. You know you mentioned high EBI um, Holstein Friesian sires um, in terms of the the bull selection that you're using to breed your replacements. Um, 
also, I guess we can we can bring that back then to the fat and protein and the high level of milk solids you're talking about. Do you see the EBI uh, performing for the herd at Kildalton? Definitely, I do. As Zarlina mentioned, we're in the top three percent in in the country, and uh, the fat and protein and um, the fertility of our cows is kind of matching what the EBI reports are telling us. Um, so, as, as I mentioned there, the 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 eleven week ca- eleven week breeding window um, brings in a very a very a very high um, six week uh, in calf rate and uh, six week calf rate. So. Um, I, I would be putting a lot of that towards EBI and through the last um, number of years, years of constantly selecting uh, bulls um, from, from the EBI index. And Zerlina, to change direction a little bit, um, when we think about Kildalton College, you know, some of us would have been there um, two years ago to, um, I suppose, to attend an open day as part of the open source uh, sustainability uh, dairy farms or a demo farm. You know, um, what did this project involve for Kildalton and what did Kildalton do for this project? Yeah, I suppose the the objective of the Kildalton Open Source Farm was to provide a a showcase, I suppose, for sustainable farming to our students, uh, to farmers, and I suppose to the wider audience. So although the Kildalton herd has always, it's always operated as a a relatively high, you know, level of technical efficiency, I suppose the challenge for the open source project was to further improve on the productivity within the farm. But at the same time, you know, reduce the requirements for both the chemical fertilizer and the supplemental feeds um, that would be given to, to the livestock. So the main improvement pathways for the farm included continuing to increase the soil fertility um, and the sward productivity. And I mean, today we only have two paddocks out of the 30 that we have that have a soil index below three for peas or Ks. So we also focused on increasing the EBI, as, as Aidan's mentioned, um, for, for the herd. And we've seen, I suppose, the, the benefits of that through the years. Um, and also to establish white clover within the dairy pastures, um, just to reduce fertilizer application and also, also to recede underperforming swords. So we'd aim every year to try and achieve you know, 10% reseed on the paddocks that are, that are under, underperforming. Um, obviously, that's dependent on weather. So we've worked on those for the last you know, number of years and I suppose that's continued on um, from, from the start of this project. And, and, and as we're aware, the project has concluded and, um, you know, at, at that point, some practices can stop in reality on farms. Is this the case, Aidan, at Kildalton or have ye, I suppose, continued on the, the progress that you've made across the project? Yeah, so we have continued on. Emma. Yeah, the project has ceased, but uh, as, as Zarlina would have mentioned, there we're continuing with our high EBI stock to try and maximise the milk solids per cow and to increase the long- longevity per cow in the herd. Um, so the change to protected urea as well, we're, we're keeping up with that, and we spread all our slurry through low emission spreading techniques uh, to help reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, Zarlina mentioned clover, and it is a major role in our grazing platform help fix atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, this is incorporated to our paddocks at receding or by over sowing during the summer months. Um, what's new, I suppose, that wasn't going on earlier is um, we began planting native hedge grows across the farm this year. Um, so white and black thorn and holly hedges were planted in March and uh, we will add this, um, we will add the amount that's been planted over the next few years. Uh, also, we have added wild margins across the dairy unit to encourage biodiversity and to help increase local, I suppose, quality, the local quality of local waterways. Um, So we will also engage, I suppose, with the new Tagus signpost program that is set to reduce climate change, which is uh, which has been issued there recently. So I guess, you know, you're you're taking a lot of boxes, you know, in terms of uh, practices that are going to reduce the environmental footprint of the farm. But, you know, as we've discussed several times on, on this podcast and we've seen, you know, across wider conversations, this is also going to have a positive impact on productivity. You know, you, you know, time and time again in this conversation, a high EBI stock has come up and the fact that it's delivering for you. I guess if if we again change direction, um, you know, y- you've mentioned at, at certain points about students and the, the role of um 
the DIR unit in, in terms of teaching students and, and teaching is a big element of day to day operations across um, the college in general, but also specifically the dairy side of things. Um, Aidan, from your perspective, can you give us um, an idea of some of the skills that you're working with students to, I guess, demonstrate and show them how to, um, I suppose, how they work and, and how to do it themselves? Yeah, no, no problem, Emma. So I suppose the delivery of dairy skills, it occurs to level five and six dairy students, which would be TAGA students, but we also deliver this to WIT students, which uh, which also receive dairy practicals throughout their time here in Kildallan. Uh, so the delivery of the dairy skills to our students in Kildallan covers a wide range, I suppose, of everyday practical skills. Uh, they are st- demonstrated and each student gets an opportunity to complete them uh, while they are here. So in general, the skills are broken up really into various sections. Uh, for example, let's say with regards to animal husbandry, students will learn to administer and record animal remedies. Uh, so they will learn to calf a cow and take care of a newborn calf. Uh, and they will also feed mixed milk replacer, let's say, stomach tube calves and deboat calves in Kildallan. And they'll also do this on local farms around the area as we don't have enough um, calves, let's say, to de- dehorn just here in Kildallan for the number of students we have. Uh, we'll also demonstrate skills on rear and replacement heifers and selecting re- replacement stock. Uh, we go through heat detection, fertility and breeding of heifers and cows in quite, quite a lot of detail. Students also score cows for locomotion and body condition score, and they'll design a winter feed plan for our stock who may be under or over conditioned. So we'll go through our own, let's say, silage pH results and go through the stock we have, and we'll assess what we have here in Culloden. Milk quality practicals take place, which include dry cow therapy and selective dry cow therapy, as Zerlina mentioned earlier, which both are practiced with students using our own cows here in Culloden, so it's quite hands-on. And I suppose best practice for milk and procedures completed as well in Culloden and on outside farms. So we just don't use the Culloden parlor due to the number of students we have. So, so we use state-of-the-art parlors in the area and the students generally like to see what else is going on out there and not just see what they have in um, in Culloden or what we have in Culloden. So we have an excellent relationship with outside farmers uh, that we are able to bring students uh, to these farms to milk and the horn calves. Uh, students become familiarised also with milk machine parts and the ma- maintenance of the parlour. This is done using our specialised milk and demonstration workshop where we have four operating milk and machines kitted out, which is which is quite um, which is quite a, a nice nice thing to have here in Culloden. Uh, grassland skills are also completed by all the area st- students which consists of skills like grass measuring, budgeting, weed ID, uh, fencing and plumbing, uh, grassland infrastructure. Uh, so throughout the year then we aim to match uh, the practicals we're demonstrating with the students with what's relevant at the time of year. So for example, only last week we we're going through drying off cows. Before that we we're talking about maybe body condition score uh, and before that weighing uh, our weaning and heifers. So we try and match what's happening with the with a certain time of year so students can bring it home and put it into place straight away. Uh, I suppose probably the most practical element of the course is when students are on farm placement of host farms across the country. Uh, students will learn new skills here and put what we have demonstrated in Culloden into action. So similar work is carried out by our first year stu- students here as well, who complete a week's work morning and evening between class on Culloden's dairy unit or two other outside farms. So we call it farm specials, uh, they'll milk in the morning and evening for a full week, either in Culloden or in outside farms. I suppose just to mention then, in future weeks, we are upgrading our own facilities here in Culloden. Uh, we're upgrading our milking parlour and we are in the process of expanding the college farmyard, which will consist of a state-of-the-art calf shed, which will all benefit student learning in the future. I think that's really interesting, Aidan. And, you know, we have a variety of listeners here, some people who have graduated in the last year and, and up to, you know, 40 years ago have left Kildalton or, you know, one of the other five agricultural colleges. And I, I'd say some of them are ticking off um, in their head, you know, the skills that they have completed, uh, as you've mentioned them. Um, and I think it's a really interesting thing that you you say that they get to practice all of these skills either on the Kildalton farm or on a neighbouring farm and indeed they can take them home and implement best practice at home or on you know on the family farm or a neighbouring farm that they'd 
be working on. I guess a, a really interesting aspect of, of teaching is this year has been like no other um, given COVID um, and particularly when we, we th- t- think about skills and the the fact that they're, you know, in person and generally in groups. Um, I suppose, Zerlina, can you give us some insight into how COVID has impacted on the delivery of, I, I suppose, class content, um, you know, you know, the technical side of things and the skills also for students? Yeah, of course. So I suppose the staff and the management here were very quick to implement, you know, the COVID protocols in the college. Um, and that really helped out. So it just meant that even in our most recent level five restrictions, we had students in the college completing practicals, you know, and they were outside mostly in a socially distant setting, you know, wearing masks at all times. So all students have to wear masks, even in a practical setting. But I suppose, you know, things like grass walks and um, practicals involving the machinery outside and um, all the practicals they do with the livestock, as, as Aidan's mentioned, all of those could still go ahead. Um, and that's been great because it means students aren't missing out on their, their core coursework. So as Aidan said, there's certain times a year when we have to do particular skills with students and there really is no other time of year that we can do them. So it's been great for students. It's been a consistency for them as well. Um, for once, we're hearing students actually being, you know, absolutely delighted to have to go to college every day um, and be in college because they just love um, being in and learning and doing the practical elements. It's, it's something that every year we get back from students is being outside and getting to learn all those core skills. Um, I suppose the only element that we've had online today has, has been the theory classes and um, they're something that are still ongoing online but you know students have been fantastic to adapt to um, you know Zoom uh, classes and, and having to, to kind of log in online and they've gotten used to it but I suppose just having that core practical element still in the college um, has really really helped them out and it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, even I suppose in the year, as you say, um, in the year that, that, that it is, it's been a tough year for everybody. And I suppose for students, every student has a mentor, um, a staff member who mentors them here in the college. So, you know, even just, just checking in with students um, and everything to do with mental health, it's been very, um, very important, I suppose, in terms of mental health and, and just making sure students are, are coping well with the year that's in it. But having them in the college has been, has been a great consistency and, and they've absolutely loved it. Um, and, you know, even things like we have, we have certain students that maybe have some learning difficulties and, you know, we make sure that they get the, the help and things they need when it comes to theory classes and when it comes to, I suppose, up to this time of year when they're coming into exam time, just to make sure, even though we mightn't be in contact with them all the time, um, that, you know, they're just a phone call away and, and they know that as well, um, even for the times they're not in the college. So, you know, it's, it's been something that everybody's adapted to, but... Uh, the students have been have been great in that respect too. I think it's really reassuring what you say and I, you know Kildalton like all of the six ag colleges in the country continue to deliver as you say consistently you know uh, particularly with the practical elements of the course that that the the students um, love so much. I think it's also really interesting from our discussion today how you know there's a huge amount of teaching um, within an operation or an operating uh, dairy farm so you know it's a teaching farm but it's also a farm that's a achieving a really high level of technical performance. Um, you know, thanks to uh, Zerlina and Aidan for joining me today and we look forward to following updates from the Kildalton Dairy Unit and, and hopefully we will see more from you um, throughout the Signpost Farm Project. Thanks very much, Emma. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast and my thanks to Zerlina Pratt and Aidan Nugent for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.